Mr. Tan oversees land use planning, redevelopment, procurement, and counter management, as well as master planning and development of JTC's next generation estate, such as One North and Jurong Innovation District. Ms. Tan is also involved in the development of the Jurong Island as the world's top 10 chemical and energy hub and the Jurong Rock Havens, Southeast Asia's first underground liquid hydrocarbon storage facility. Today's lecture will start off with a presentation by Mr. David Tan, followed by a Q&A session with the audience, moderated by Mr. Tan Sui Han, Head of Sustainability at Sabana Jurong. We would now like to welcome Ms. David Tan on stage to commence his presentation. Mr. Tan, please. So maybe for some of those who may not know who JTC is, right? We are a government agency under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, which is an economic agency. So our key role is really to support uh, Singapore economic growth, right? So that uh, we can create jobs, uh, good quality jobs in a good conducive environment uh, for Singaporeans. So essentially that's what our job is, right? To make sure that we have land and space uh, for the people uh, to work in. And if you look at our mission, our mission is really to uh, develop industrial infrastructure, uh, focusing a lot on industrial, right? Uh, and later on, I will share a little bit about how we are slightly moving away from industrial, but still predominantly focusing on industrial. And really to help catalyze the growth of new industries, okay? So looking at new industries, such as advanced manufacturing, as well as uh, to transform existing industries. You probably have heard about the uh, Committee for uh, Future Economy uh, who, who has these uh, plans to develop uh, various industry transformation maps uh, for industries. Right? Uh, and, and our job is really uh, to be part of that, to be able to create uh, land and space uh, to support the various industry transformation maps. That's the so-called the outline of my presentation uh, later on. Um, let me just share with you uh, our industrial story first. How many of you know or have heard a lot about JTC industrial story? Just a show of hands. Maybe not so much the younger people because the younger people, six, 1968, okay, we were born. Actually, just to share with you, uh, we were actually born in 1968. We were originally part of the Singapore Economic Development Board, which was formed in 1961. Uh, as our name suggests, we were tasked to develop Jurong Town. Okay? Jurong Town is anything from Jurong East to the West. Right? For those who live in Singapore, Jurong Town is anything from Jurong East to the West. Okay? So our job was actually to develop the Jurong Town. Right? Of course, we are a stat board and we are focused, in the early years, we really focused on not only industrial development, but we also focused on uh, providing a township. So we built flats, we built recreational facilities, gardens, and so on and so forth. So I will share with you from 1970s onwards, right? immediately after Singapore's independence. Uh, and during that time, Singapore, of course, has a very uh, small domestic market. Uh, and the environment then was that companies from developed countries uh, were also looking to relocate some of their manufacturing uh, activities. So obviously, they were looking around the world. They come over to Singapore to set up their uh, businesses or at least their manufacturing facilities. And our, our strategies then was really as an export-led uh, industrialization program, okay? Uh, so that we bring in the uh, industries and the industry will manufacture. And then the manuf of course, most of the uh, products that is actually produced uh, will be exported uh, to the region as well as to the world. And really at that point, we are focusing on creating jobs to pursue what we call a labor-intensive industries, essentially to provide jobs for the people, right? Good quality jobs, uh, and so some of the industries could be garment factories, um, woodworking, like uh, furniture industries. Sixty-eight. This is how Jurong used to look like: uh, uh, swamplands with lots of hills. So our job was really to transform uh, the whole swampland of Jurong. Uh, into a thriving industrial estate. And we managed to do it in over sh shortly in, in just about three years, right? Transforming the landscape and putting in industries, preparing the land, putting the infrastructure, and uh, ensuring that uh, industries can come. And our job then was really to prepare what we call space, right? Industrial space. And that can be in two forms. One is 
uh, we prepare the land for companies who want to build their own factories. Two, we build uh, standard or flatter factories. So these are what we call land-based as well as high-rise or multi-story factories. Right. Uh, and these are essentially for companies who want to have quick startup. So they don't want to build their own. They don't mind uh, renting a space uh, from JTC. As I mentioned, uh, it's not only industrial development that we look at, but we also look at developing Jurong as a township. So we, put, we actually built the Chinese garden, the Japanese garden, uh, as well as the Singapore Science Center. So move on to another 10 years down the road, 1980s to 1990s. Uh, as you know, the economy grew uh, through the dependence on the so-called abundance labor okay, and affordable labor. And also, um, many countries are also opening up during that period of time, uh, especially around our region. Okay. And also in 1985, we had our first recession. So since independence until 1985, there wasn't really a recession. But the recession really hit us in Singapore in 1985. Our strategies then was really a twin engine of growth. One that focuses on manufacturing as well as services. Okay, so that's in the 80s and the 90s. And for manufacturing, we focus a lot more now. Instead of the so-called lower value added manufacturing activities, we focus a little bit more on the higher value capital as well as technology intensive industries. So in terms of the types of industrial typology or industrial facilities that we built at that point in time, uh, we started to look at business parks. Okay? Uh, and uh, that's really the uh, Singapore Science Park, uh, which is at Buena Vista. Uh, the International Business Park that's in Jurong and the Changi Business Park, which is located in uh, Changi. Okay? Uh, and these business parts, of course, cater to both the manufacturing as well as the services industries. Okay, so that was our strategy in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and at that point in time, we also focused a lot on capital-intensive industries. So what are some of these capital-intensive industries? Uh, for example, uh, the uh, Jurong Island, which is for the chemical industries. This is a picture of how Jurong Island looked like in 1998. Right, which we started in uh, 1995, as well as the uh, so-called the semiconductor industry. So today we have about four wafer fat parks uh, located throughout Singapore to support the semiconductor industries. But the key at that point in time was really this concept about cluster development. Uh, what does cluster development mean? Essentially, it is uh, a concept where we cluster industries together so that they can enjoy uh, synergy, right? And they can enjoy economies of scale. Uh, and hopefully, because they are closely uh, located, they actually uh, have a lot more business collaboration and therefore reduce business cost. Then come 2000. That's where we focus a lot more on knowledge-based industry. Okay? Uh, and during that time, the, the challenges were really in the area of globalization and technology advancement. Okay. Things have changed. I mean, things have improved. Right? In the good old days, I remember going to, to, to work. We don't even have a computer. Right? I don't know how many of you started work without a computer. Probably many of you started work without computers. Right? Computers only came on board probably in the 1990s, mid. That's when we all can afford to have one computer each. Uh, but so the strategy then was very different, focused a lot more on knowledge-based econ uh, economy. And the strategies then was really to leverage on our connectivity with uh, the world to create an ecosystem of large companies, uh, small SM, uh, SMEs as well as uh, startup companies. Right? Focus a lot on innovation-based uh, industries. So uh, industries such as the biomedical sciences, uh, infocom and technology, as well as the media industries. Uh, so in a sense, we try to uh, enhance Singapore's connectivity to the world. We actually develop ALPS. Right, airport logistics park. Very similar to like a transshipment port. Okay? The ELPS allows companies right, uh, to fly in their products and do value added services within a free trade area and then export it out again right? without even having to come through into Singapore. I mean, physically they are in Singapore, but uh, in terms of the trade, they are actually within a free trade zone. Okay? So that's how we en enhance Singapore connectivity uh, with the world. Secondly, 
Uh, we also, at that point in time, created One North. That's when One North was born, 2001. Okay? And we started to develop One North as what I call a so-called a work, live, play, learn uh, hub. Uh, like a, like a, like, like, it's actually a business park, okay? uh, but it's a hub that allows uh, mixed use, okay? work, live, play, and learn. Uh, so this is how One North actually, uh, well, it is, this is how One North will look like when it's fully completed. But at that point in time, we have Fusionopolis, Biopolis, as well as uh, some of the F&B uh, facilities within One North. So trying to make it like a self-contained hub. Okay. So moving forward, 2010 onwards, what are some of the challenges uh, that we will face? Any guess? I guess you all have some answers behind you, but some of the challenges that is facing us. Essentially, five key challenges, and I think these five key challenges not only face our industry or industrial uh, development, but I think these five challenges may also apply to other sectors of the economy. First, land, land constraint. Right? Singapore is 720 square kilometers. Right? Uh, a lot of our land has been reserved for many different uses, so we need to uh, ensure that we have efficient use of the land space. Second is really economy. The manufacturing sector has changed, and later I'll explain a little bit more with more and more servicization. Okay. Third is really the labor. Labor profile has changed, and also the uh, expectation of the workforce has changed, and I'll explain that later. The fourthly is environment, where we, a lot of industry will focus on uh, sustainability and uh, livability. And I understand that there are lots of um, architects and engineers uh, among our midst today, and we can have a few chat about what are some of the sustainable features that we can look at. Uh, and also, of course, the issue about carbon footprint, uh, reduction of carbon emissions, and so on. And finally, technology. Right? With the advance in technology, really things have changed a lot. And there are lots of disruptive technologies such as robotics, automation, uh, Industry 4.0 and so on. So land constraint. Uh, as you can see, uh, the purple part, this is actually from the URA concept plan. All right? It's available in the URA website. You can have a look at it. Uh, the purple area are all the uh, industrial land. Okay? The uh, so-called the uh, lighter orange color, these are all the residential, and then of course you have the green and the waters and so on and so forth. Okay. I think there is a cap on the land supply, so called, right? Singapore is only so small, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't get larger. Uh, and there's also a limit on the plot ratio, for example, for industry. Uh, in the early years, when we first started to build our flatter factories and our standard factories, the plot ratio was actually quite low, about 0 0.5 on average. Uh, today we are going up to 2.5, 3 plot ratio. Uh, you're familiar with plot ratios, right? I think all the architects are very familiar with plot ratios. Okay. Uh, so there is also a limit on how much you can go for industrial buildings. Because as you go higher and higher, you need to bring the goods up. Okay. So there is always a limit on how high you can go. And the question is really we ask ourselves, how can you generate more value right, from the same amount of land? Okay. That's a big question that we ask. We constantly ask ourselves, and I think as architects and engineers, we also need to ask ourselves the question, how do we design our buildings and infrastructure so that uh, we maximize or optimize uh, the building, the function, and so on. Now, manufacturing will continue to remain a key pillar of Singapore's economy. It fluctuates around 20 to 25% of our GDP. Okay? Uh, and you can see 20% in the, of GDP in 2015. Uh, so manufacturing is important, and it will continue to remain important in Singapore. Right? It will be a part of our Singapore's economy. Although we look at various different types of industries, from uh, capital to technology to so uh, called knowledge and innovation, uh, it doesn't mean that we are all going to focus just on innovation in the uh, base industries. Right? The capital ones are still important. The technology based industries are equally important. Uh, a very important thing is really a diversification of our own manufacturing. Right? We can't have one of one type, but we want to have many of different types 
okay, to diversify our economy. So manufacturing is important. Right? Unlike a lot of countries uh, that have moved away from manufacturing, but I think it's important that Singapore retains its manufacturing sector because that provides a lot of economic spin-off for our economy. Just take chemical industry, for example. Right? The amount of plastics they produce will require the services sector and would need to be exported. Okay, uh, so that in itself has a lot of economic spin-off. Second, is that the manufacturing, uh, uh, what the kind of manufacturing activities uh, will also change slightly. I think in the past we focused a lot in the center production. I don't know whether those at the back can see. You have these three wheels. First, first wheel is what we call pre-production. Second wheel is production. Third wheel is post-production. <coughs> I think in the past, we focused a lot more on production. But I think moving forward, we will focus also on the pre-production side as well as the post-production side. The pre-production essentially are your R&D okay, and your prototyping. Coming up with the right design, coming up with the right prototype, and then to manufacture in Singapore, and then after that, post-production, which is manufacturing services. Take, take an example. I know the salt system is here today, aerospace industries. Uh, today we have Rolls Royce. I, I, I use the word Rolls Royce, right? I know you are here. You also are in the aerospace industry. But take Rolls Royce for example. Do you think Rolls Royce sells engines? Or do, do you think that Rolls Royce provides engine as a solution? As a solution, right? They probably sell you very, I'm not sure whether they sell low or not, but they do sell you. But the partnership and the collaboration is really a long-term partnership to service uh, the, the, the engines. All right? So it becomes manufacturing services. And that's really the post-production that's important. So the type of industry that we want is really pre-production, production, and post-production. And of course, then the type of buildings and the type of infrastructure that we provide must also cater for that. Right? It's no longer just manufacturing production, but the pre and the post. Then, of course, we need to, the growth of services, right? Uh, how do we cater to these changes? What kind of buildings we need to build to be able to do that? And also, the question we ask ourselves is moving from industrial space to economic space. Because today, a company, when they come set up businesses, they will have their R&D functions, they will have their HQ functions, they will have their um, manufacturing functions, and also uh, services function, uh, even some of them back-end functions. And you can't have a company say, my HQ is in Shenton Way, my production is in uh, uh, Jurong, and my R&D is in One North. That doesn't work, right? You, know, you don't want to have three different, uh, one company in three different locations. So how do we then create the space to make sure that we put these trees together? I think that's the question that I would like to ask all the architects and the engineers, right? How do you do that? So our labor profile, right? So talked about economy, talked about the land. We now talk about labor. If we look at this chart, this is a, a, a prediction that the number of PMET and non-PMET in 2011 is about 50-50. But I think moving forward, right? Uh, this is just a projection, huh? moving forward. Uh, I think the amount of PMET to non-PMET uh, will be much higher, right? As you know, more and more people are entering into university or diploma. Uh, question is, with more and more graduates, how would that change the uh, so-called the, uh, the the industry? Okay, the number of people going into the industry. Um, in the past, we also uh, bring people to job. Okay, if you look at how Singapore is uh, developed in terms of manufacturing. Most of the manufacturing activities are in the West, so we bring people to jobs. I think the question we ask is, how do you bring jobs to people? Right? How do you bring jobs to people? I probably pose a lot more questions than giving you answers. <laughs> and also changing, uh, in the past, we were quite happy with hawker centers and amenity centers in our, in our industrial estates. Uh, but I think we are now, maybe because of our weather, uh, we are looking forward to more food courts or aircon food courts. 
So the expectation of the workforce changes. Then the question is, how do we then develop our building and infrastructure to support that change in expectations? And of course, our workforce is now more environmentally conscious. They need to stay connected, right? Uh, they are socially minded. They prefer work-life balance. Yeah, I know a lot of young people at the back, you know. Whenever you ask them, what would you like? I would like to have work-life balance, okay? Uh, flexible working hours, for example, okay? Uh, they want to have informal collaboration. Uh, active mobility is very important, right? Most of them prefer to take public transport, which is, I think, good for Singapore, so that we can move towards a car-like uh, society. So we need to cater. I think the message is we need to cater to the changing workforce expectations. Uh, that's very important. The way we work is also changing, right? Uh, can we rent or lease space to individuals? Uh, typical lease today is three years, right? Three plus three, you know, you always hear about three plus three plus three, right? What up, and we always lease space to companies. What about leasing space to individuals, right? How do we do that? Can we have short-term leases, okay? Uh, three months, two months, and we talk about co-work spaces, right? WeWork is very popular today. Uh, I believe their leases are actually very, very short. I think the other uh, 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 so-called challenge is really environment. Many, many examples of environment, uh, how we need to take care of environment. Uh, and associated with the environment are a few key concepts. One, of course, is how do we put industry closer to? Maybe not next to, lah. Huh? but closer to, all right, uh, to ensure that we have this synergy. How do we create our industrial spaces that is conducive? I use the word conducive, right? Conducive for the people to work in as well as to live in, right? And in terms of design, back to basic. I don't know whether not many atap houses left in Singapore today. For those been around for some time, I think you remember the atap houses. In fact, the upper houses are designed very nicely, right? Just look at the atap house. They are raised because of flooding, right? It's risk of flooding. But because they are raised, the airflow is very good. So you don't need air condition, okay? Uh, they're made of wood so that it doesn't absorb heat. So you don't have a problem about urban he island heat issues, okay? Your ETT ETTV value is very low. Okay, for those who know the ETT value, right? Thermo, uh, emission thermal transfer value, right? That's the amount of heat gain that the building structure will take. You have the overhanging roof that provide sun shading and yet provide lighting into our buildings or into the atap house. So the question is, are we going back to basics in terms of some of our sustainable buildings that we are building? Okay, I think that's the question we would like to ask. Safety is also very important, uh, and within JTC, uh, when we build our facilities, we want to ensure that safety is the utmost importance. And here I'm just sh sharing one example. Uh, this is how the site looks like before. This is how the site looks like after. And we are practicing these five S's. Essentially, in short, is area cleaning for those who go to, to the army. Making sure that your site is clean. <laughs> right? When the site is clean, it reduces the risk of Accidents, all right? So yeah, people call five S's, nah, I call it area cleaning. Making sure you clean up the area after you have finished your work so that it doesn't create a hazard and therefore reduces accidents. Technology is also changing the way we do things, right? How will robotics, automation, and industry 4.0 affect the workplace? We are not saying robots will take over our work, no. Right? But I think what we are saying is that there will be automation and so on to help us do our jobs better. Right? Do our jobs more productive and more efficiently. And secondly, this guy, right? he's probably working in some offices. But the question is, is he working at home? Or is he working in the office? Or is he an employee or a freelancer? Right? You have different disruptors like Uber, Airbnb. But you also now to, nowadays have a lot of freelancers who will help and work and, and, and they don't need uh, industrial space, right? So 
these are some of the things that are changing out there. Disruptive technology too, for example. And this is uh, a few things that GTC have done in the past. Uh, let's take use of drones. In the past, okay, this is not a very good example of an uh, industrial building. Uh, this is actually a normal house. But for, for us in the past, when we want to inspect a building, we have to either build a scaffold or we have to take a boom lift, something like this, to go up to the roof to do inspection, to check for mosquito breeding and so on and so forth. But within JTC now, we have a drone that flies all the way up. You can inspect a lot of roof spaces and you can actually determine whether there's any water ponding or any cracks or anything. Right? That sort of helps us in our productivity. Uh, in fact, at One North, we are the first to have a public trial of a driverless taxis. Okay? Uh, we are working with this company called Autonomy. Right? So we provide our industrial building and industrial estates or district as platforms, as a living lab for companies to test bed their facilities. Okay. So that's what we do. And, and here we are building a, uh, a test track uh, for AV research at Clean Tech Park. So I've shared with you our story. I've shared with you our challenges. Let me share with you now what are some of the strategies that we have adopted moving forward. We will provide innovative building solutions to transform industries. That will be the key. Right? We will not just build generic buildings. We will build buildings that help companies right, to be more competitive in today's economic environment. What does that mean? Some of it we have done, like clustering. We cluster industries together, not only at the estate level, but at the building level. We also, within our building, provide shared facilities and shared services. Let's take an example of, uh, and these are some of our uh, facilities. So let's take an example of uh, Food Hub, right? We all, Singaporeans love food, <laughs> okay? Food Hub. Food Hub, we hope to cluster a few food industries together. Now, some of these food industries will require, for example, a cold room to store their food after they have prepared them before they are being exported or so on. So like fish balls, right? Or even roti prata. Today you can buy roti prata in packages, right? Uh, you don't have to go to the hawker center, but you can actually buy roti prata in packages. So instead of each individual food company have their own cold room, what we did was we worked with a, we built a centralized cold room so that that would then help companies to reduce their capital expenditure Right? And also their operation, OPEX, so KPEX and OPEX. Then the food company will be able to operate more efficiently within the building. Okay, so that's an example of a food. Another example could be, uh, say, uh, Surface Engineering Hub. Surface Engineering Hub is uh, for companies in the business of surface treatment, heat treatment, and so on and so forth. Okay, so Heat treatment, what do you mean by that? Everyone has a phone, right, nowadays. And sometimes the phone at the back of the phone uh, is very shiny. Right? So it has been treated to be shiny. Okay? Uh, so in order to do that, you need to, have, you need to put a lot of chemicals onto the, onto the, onto the phone. Uh, not the phone, but the, the metal. Okay? And those metals, uh, after going through the processes, uh, you actually use a lot of chemicals. Okay. So the chemicals are, in a sense, hazardous, right? Some, some may be hazardous. So some are acid, some are alkaline, and so on and so forth. So we actually built a centralized wastewater treatment plant. Right? A centralized one for the companies located within our buildings. And they can then discharge directly from their factory space, which can be on the second floor, third floor, or the fourth floor, and discharge it like a sewer all the way down into the centralized wastewater treatment plant. So in a sense, we design these buildings that is very different from a generic building, a generic factory. It will have very interesting features, and I guess the architects have to think very differently about how to design the building so that the services don't clash, the movement of the goods and the people 
don't clash, right? Uh, how do you design your building that is what I call very functional, right? Not only must it be, say, a green mark building, but it also must be very functional, right? It must meet the needs of the industries that's located there. We have many other innovative space, right? For various different industry. For the aviation or aerospace industries, we have the Aviation 1 example, Aviation 2. For the clean tech industries, we have clean tech 1 and clean tech 3, uh, clean tech 2, sorry. Uh, for surface engineering, of course, I just mentioned. And even for medical technology, we also have another one. And these are some of the completed uh, innovative space uh, that we have done in the last, say, three to five years. Uh, moving forward, we are currently still building some, right? An example could be a tip, uh, space at Tampines. Uh, even for chemicals, right? We are building a chemicals uh, hub. And that allow us to co-locate some of the chemical companies together. And this particular building, for example, is designed in such a way that as long as you produce or use certain types of chemicals, it's like a pre-approved. Because if you use these chemicals within the chemical hub, it will be considered safe. Right? And we have sufficient firefighting, uh, even foam fighting, to ensure that, and even blast-proof walls and windows that if really, really, let's just touch wood, that something really, really does go wrong, the surrounding will still be safe. Okay, And that's how we design them. So from a design perspective, our new buildings will be very innovative and very different. Okay, uh, You have to think through your design, right? Blast-resistant, for example. How do you have a underground tanks that stores water over and above SCDF's requirement for firefighting. Okay, so these are some of the things that are in our buildings. Okay, um, nano space for the semiconductor in the, in, uh, industries, as well as JTC space at Tuas. Uh, let me give you an example of this, a little bit more example about JTC space at Tuas. This is the first kind, first of its kind, integrated industrial development with a work, live, and play concept. Uh, it will house many different facilities. For example, a heavy vehicle park, workers' dormitory, amenity, and different types of factories for light and heavy. Right? It will have ramp-ups, flattered, as well as land-based factories, all located in one location. It's currently under construction, and if you drive along the AYE on the way to the second link, it's on the left-hand side. Those for the, uh, in addition to some of these uh, industries, we are also looking at providing uh, spaces for new industries. Okay. Uh, the launch pad at One North, for example. How many of you have been to launch pad? How many of you have been to timber? Uh, more people go to timber, right? Okay. <laughs> if you have not been to timber, I will encourage you to go to timber. It is a hawker center by day, and it's a pub by night. Right? Lots of different food. I was told the beer has a lot of selection of beers, okay? Uh, but please uh, don't drink and drive, <laughs> okay? Um, so Launchpad is for the startup industries, okay? Uh, these industries, they don't require a uh, very big space. So some of them can be 10, 20, 20 square meters. Of course, if you want bigger spaces, you have more startup, you can have 50, 100 square meters. Not, not an issue because all our buildings are designed flexibly that can be expanded. So today I take 20, tomorrow I can take 40, the next day I can take 60. Of course, it's multiples of something. Lah. So in this case for the launch pad, I think it's multiple of 20. Okay. Uh, and, and it can be short-term lease, uh, long-term lease to help the, the, the startup industries. Okay. Uh, so we have two launch pads. The one at One North is completed. The one at Jurong Innovation District, which I'll share a little bit about later, will be completed in the middle of this year. Okay? And we locate our launch pads next to or close to universities. Because it's very important that, uh, that uh, there is this what I call industry-academia collaboration. Right? Most of our launch startups are actually uh, from people coming out from the university uh, who have a very good idea. And we help to nurture that good idea.
by providing the right space for them. Of course, we are not an incubator or an accelerator. There are incubator accelerators as well as venture capitalists out there who supports them. But we make sure that we bring the ecosystem together. Right? So the space at Launchpad will have VCs, accelerators, incubators, as well as startup companies. You probably have heard recently uh, that uh, we want to develop Pongo as a cyber security. Okay? So that is another example where we create a new area uh, where we have uh, uh, support a new industry called the cyber security industry. So that will be at Pongo. And lastly, advanced manufacturing. These are your industry 4.0 where you have a lot more automation, a lot more robotics, a lot more Internet of Things type technology. And that we will go to Jurong Innovation District or even the Clean Tech Park that is located within uh, Jurong Innovation District. So in a sense, we look at the various industries and we provide the necessary land and space for the various industries. I think in addition to those things I've mentioned, we are also looking at other areas to keep pace with the emerging trends. Um, we talked about buildings. What about at the whole district level? Okay. Uh, we talked about providing space. What about flexible space? And lastly, after we have built the infrastructure, how do we create a community? How do we build a community with this thing called place-making initiatives? Okay. Uh, let me share with you. So as a master developer, um, we look at a whole district. So an example is Jurong Innovation District and One North. These are district level uh, facilities. Okay. Um, so we try to integrate various users inside the, district, in, inside the estate, looking at work, live, play, and learn. And within this area, we want to ensure that they are sustainable, livable, accessible or connected, as well as smart solutions within the estate. We also want to use our estate as living labs for companies to test bed their innovative technology or yet to commercialize technology. And lastly, we want to foster a vibrant community uh, through placemaking activities. So, in our mixed-use district, these are the key design features right, that we need to have. It must be smart, uh, it must be sustainable and livable, well-connected, industry academia uh, integration or collaboration as well as vibrant. Let me share with you two case studies. First is One North, second is Jurong Innovation District. So let's start with One North. I think more of us are familiar with One North. One North, 200 hectares. It precinct, 48 buildings, 400 companies, 800 startups, and 46,000 workers working there today. It was developed progressively from 2001. That's the numbers that we have achieved today. We focus on four key areas, work, live, play, and learn. In terms of work, we have various developments, the biopolis for the biomedical sciences, the fusional police for the ICT, media, science, and engineering, the media police for the media, and the launch pad for startup incubators and accelerators. In terms of lift, we have a few typology there. We have condominiums, uh, of course, surrounded by the surrounding residential estates. We have apartments uh, left behind uh, uh, from the colonial times, as well as uh, F&B facilities within One North. In terms of play, Star Vista is there, uh, Timber Plus, of course. We do have a One North Park that so-called runs across the whole One North. And for those who want to uh, bring your family, please come to One North Park. Okay. Timber plants, of course, as well as lots of F&B at uh, some of the selected bungalows within One North. And lastly, learn. Uh, we have INSEAD there, ESAC, both are business schools, as well as corporate universities from Unilever and BASF. Okay. So we also look at talent development within One North. So all these all integrated together. So not only are we now planning at the building level, but we are planning at the estate level, at the district level. And the design and the planning and the design of all these are very, very different. Okay? Because 
you not only need to cater for a building, but how the building and the buildings interact with each other. You have to look at connectivity, footpath, how people move from public transportation nodes uh, to the facilities. Okay? How do they move efficiently? All right? Taking into consideration of user behavior, taking into consideration of uh, social behavior. Right? A very, very different type of design that needs to go into the buildings. And, of course, placemaking. How do you build intellectual vibrancy as well as social vibrancy? How do you build a community so that people can come together? Not to socialize, right? I mean, socialize is important. But hopefully when they socialize, they interact and then they collaborate. Especially startups. So I may be doing something, you may be doing something, but I have a problem trying to solve this problem, but suddenly I meet you at a, at a Timber Plus and you tell me your solution, then we collaborate. Hopefully you can become the next multi-million dollar company. That's the key. Right? Create the conducive environment for people to collaborate. Right? And you start off as social, then of course move towards intellectual uh, <clears throat> vibrancy. So, and also enhance the place. Right? We put in table soccer table or futsal tables. We put in table tennis tables. Uh, we even put in the piano to bring people together during lunchtime. And we built some of these things. I mean, they're not expensive things, but they're very simple things that can put in uh, to bring people together. Right? And also to enhance the place. And various locations within One North are designated for such things. For example, the Biopolis Epicenter, the Fusionopolis Atrium, and some of the outdoor plaza. So the key thing is when you design your buildings, you have to design them with placemaking in mind. Right. There must be areas where there are places where you can come together. Right? So it's not just design a building, a drop, a drop off point, and then they go straight to their uh, lift lobby and go all the way up to the, to, the, uh, to the offices or to the business park space or R&D space. But you need to create the space that is exciting for people to come together to collaborate, exchange ideas, and hopefully innovate. Right. That's the type of design uh, that we are looking at. Let me share with you the second example. That's Jurong Innovation District. Right? This was announced by Minister Heng some two years ago. Uh, work is still very much in progress today. Right? Uh, nothing is built yet, but a lot of planning and the design are now being put in. So it is going to be the future of innovation for enterprise, learning, and living. Right? It is going to be like One North, but a little bit more than One North. Because One North doesn't allow you to manufacture. There's no manufacturing in One North. Right? Uh, but hopefully, with Jurong Innovation District, we will be able to integrate work, live, play, learn, and create or make. How you can integrate the various users together and yet still maintain right, uh, the necessary uh, environment for people to be integrated together. So you have offices, you have R&D spaces, you have some residential, uh, you have open community space, landscape, uh, and then you have industrial space. Of course, these will not be your pollutive type industries, they will be slightly your cleaner type industries. Okay. How do you integrate all together? And how do we create a, what we call a smart district that focuses on various issues, right? I mean, these are just a few examples uh, of uh, what we mean by smart, for example, right? Smart parking, nothing new, right? It's already in existing buildings. Uh, smart waste management, shared wayfinding, intelligent street lighting, right? Mobile apps, smart meters, smart water meters, electricity meters. But the key is really to develop the smartness so that you can get good public feedback. Right? And then you can then continuously improve your building. So example in this room, um, a, a space auditorium in Jurong Innovation District will have sensors in this room. When all of us leave, the building will know that we have left and therefore turns everything off itself. 
But when we come in, the building will know that we are here. And depending on the number of people in this room, the air condition will be up or down. Right? Depending on the number of people in this room. That is what I call a smart building that responds right, to the people using it. David, um, I've noticed a few dualities that JTC has somehow managed to navigate uh, over the years. First of all is constraints and opportunities. Right? So you've turned what is effectively a swamp, uh, or JTC has effectively turned a swamp into an uh, industrial uh, powerhouse, I would say, uh, that's recognizable in the world. Uh, the second duality is basically the concept of globalization, meaning bringing in global industries, global players, um, global industrial players into Singapore and having them coexist and having them uh, survive and thrive with, with each other and with one another. So globalization versus international, internationalization. It is not really in your um, mandate, I would say, to internationalize, if, if, I, if I'm getting that correctly. But somehow you've managed to bring in global players into Singapore. Third duality would be corporations versus SMEs. JTC exists as a corporation, but yet um, is harboring or is encouraging the uh, thriving of SMEs, of startups, and so on. Fourth would be manufacturing versus the service and the tertiary industries. Fifth would be PMETs, PMETs versus what is the vocational skills. And we have to manage some sort of balance in between. And lastly, industry versus academia. I think you've also brought up that industry has become very nebulous. Uh, I think Airbnb does not own a single square foot of real estate, and yet its whole business is premised on real estate. Right? Uber, uh, despite buying over some fleets, Uber technically, based on the model, they don't actually need to own any fleet of cars at all. Right? So as JTC, as an industrial player, what is the new value of um, real estate uh, from the guise of JTC as a developer, a landlord, and also a placemaker? Where is the new value of real estate? Well, I think the new value essentially is that uh, we will provide flexible spaces for everyone. Right? It's not only just focused on MNCs, nor SMEs, nor even startup, but really providing spaces for everybody so that we can all come together uh, in a district so that we can be fully integrated. And when they are integrated, we also have what we call estate level utilities and services. Uh, I didn't share a lot about district cooling systems, uh, but essentially, if you have a, uh, a district, you can actually put in a district cooling system to actually help to lower some of the business costs, at least the uh, chilled water costs or the cooling costs of some of these companies. So essentially, it's that we provide flexible space for different people, different industry, different needs, uh, and they can be integrated together so that they can um, uh, reduce their business costs, becoming more competitive. Uh, so hopefully... And, and, and all this, hopefully, will help to grow our economy, will provide good jobs for our people, and also provide a good conducive environment for our people. Would you foresee any environment where um, industrialization, industrialization could happen in the absence of physical real estate? Well, we, in the past, we don't build everything. So we do partner um, other private sector developers to build. In fact, uh, we don't own 100% of all industrial space. Uh, so the answer is we don't need to own 100%. We can work with our partners to build. But I think the key thing is that when it comes to manufacturing and some of these, uh, you will still need real estate. Yeah, uh, and, but it doesn't mean that the real estate must belong to JTC. Okay? It can be belonging to anyone out there. Uh, you've described very complex uh, developments, both One North and the Jurong Innovation Precinct. Thinking back to One North, what were the, the biggest challenges in putting together that proposition? And how do you think those challenges might have changed as you're now fully enmeshed into the Innovation Precinct? Uh, it's very easy to develop a single building, or maybe one or two buildings. But it's very challenging to develop a, a district of buildings, because your consideration is totally different, right? You are not just looking at one building, you are looking at a district level. And how buildings interact, how the infrastructure interact with each other, how people move in and move out uh, needs to be taken into consideration. And as a master developer, you need to take care of that, right? You're just not just developing one building and just worry about cars going into, your, into the driveway of that building, but you have to look at how you bring people 
be it by public transport or be it by uh, private transport into the district. Uh, you need to look at car parking, you need to look at um, <clears throat> um, how buildings uh, interact with each other, right? You need to look at district cooling, you need to look at utilities, uh, and also the form and shape of the buildings, right? You don't want to have a lot of buildings all having the same height located in one location, for example. So the urban design uh, comes in uh, very differently when you develop a district. And I think these are some of the challenges that we, we, we have to go through uh, over the years. Uh, and not only that, it's also the type of industries that you want to bring in. Where do you put your startup companies? Where do you put your biomedical sciences? Where do you put your, your residential? So it's the whole value chain of master planning to design, to construction, to facilities management. And I think that the whole value chain uh, is itself a challenge. And of course, with One North, um, the many years of experience and the learnings of One North, we hope that we can do better in our next district. One North evolved quite a bit, or has evolved quite a bit from the uh, biomedical and biotechnology hub that it originally was uh, slated out to be. Um, how has the physical infrastructure adapted to that um, change, or, or rather the different needs uh, of, of the market today? Oh, okay. So we, we still started One North. I mean, we always had this plan. I mean, the whole One North is actually a business park. So the master plan takes care of uh, work, live, play, and learn. The question is how we plan all the work and the live fully integrated with each other. Then with the work, you need to decide what are the industries that need to go in. So we work very closely with the economic development agencies, like EDB, Spring, uh, ASTAR, <coughs> on and even IMDA, right? Uh, the, in the past, it's MDA and, and IDA, and now IMDA. Uh, we work very closely with them to see how we can bring uh, the industries. So we are essentially uh, an infrastructure provider, uh, and we work closely with our economic agencies to bring in the industries. And, and I think Singapore needs to respond in according to what is happening out there in the world. Right? Uh, and when we developed One North, biomedical was something that we thought Oh, and it is, we still think, right? Uh, it's an industry that we want to promote in Singapore. And I think we have been successful from that respect. And similarly, we think now uh, the, in, the ICT and the media is another group of industries that we want to do. Uh, in addition to that, it's also the science and the engineering. So that's why One North is designated to support these industries. Uh, would you be able to explain a little bit behind, of the process behind JTC deciding what the next big piece of industrial estate will be in Singapore and the process behind uh, identifying where that's going to go. So for example, you mentioned Food Hub. Uh, how was it arrived at the decision that food was going to be a big focus in the sort of industrial life in Singapore? And then how was the location for that hub uh, sort of finally pinned down? Well, as you know, um, Singapore, we are focusing on very different uh, sectors. I think there are, I can't remember how many, but I know there are more than 20 industry, industry, and, there, and we are now developing diff, over 20 industry transformation maps. Okay? Now, the transformation map essentially is to look at the industries. So we want to grow existing industry, and we want to bring in new industries. Okay? Our job is to, to determine where to put them. Right? So let's take an example of a food hub. When we do a master planning for the whole Singapore, for industry, eh? not, not, not Singapore, but industry, uh, we have to look at where are these potential locations that we can put the food industries. And we want to distribute them quite nicely around Singapore. Right? So there's one in Sunoco. Uh, I, uh, I think there's one in uh, somewhere in the Jurong area. Uh, so at and we, first of all, identify where should all the food areas be. Once we've identified that, then we look at the supporting industries that need to provide for the food. Because you don't want to have a food all clustered together. You want to have some distribution around Singapore. Because your restaurants are all not together. right? So you need to have a proper supply chain to be able to support your different restaurants and so on and so forth. So that's how we do it. Once you determine where your location of the food areas, 
then obviously the food hub will go into these areas because food in itself, uh, it needs to be located in a clean environment, right? You, you don't want to put food with chemicals together. That's the last thing you want to do. So there's always this uh, buffer area that you want to keep away the non, uh, the, the pollutive type industry away from the food. Uh, so we do that for different industry sectors. Okay, uh, diversifying some of them, putting them in different location, uh, thinking of where the warehouses are, look at where the port is. All this needs to be planned. So integrative planning, I didn't share a lot about that, but essentially integrative planning is very, very important how we plan and how we integrate. Uh, Mr. David Tan, very interesting talk. Uh, but there's one area which I thought uh, we should de deal with. Would you please share with us your, your views as to the uh, sea as a space solution and what sort of challenges do you see uh, in using C as a space solution? And how could you promote investments uh, on floating assets in Singapore? Thank you. Okay. Well, I mean, today's talk is on urban innovation in the city, so we didn't talk touch about uh, other, other innovations elsewhere. But essentially, if you look at Singapore, right, we, uh, we started off as an entreport uh, where ships come and go. We are a trading hub. Uh, there are lots of uh, opportunities to go into the sea. Okay? Uh, but of course, the challenges of going into the sea is that it needs to be connected to the main island. Right? Uh, and unless you can come up with the right technology, uh, the right connectivity, then of course, we can always tap onto the sea. Uh, as of today, I think we just focus on land. I mean, this is a topic on urban innovation. Uh, so, I mean, so that's, that's land. I think there are potential in the sea, but the technology part needs to come in first uh, before we can uh, talk about going into the sea. Because in the sea, you are totally different environment, right? Uh, whether it's fixed or floating, uh, it needs to be connected to the mainland. How do you supply your utilities? How do you supply electricity? How do you, how do you supply water? How do you, how do you remove the waste? You know, uh, and so on and so forth. So, Potential is there, and that's something that uh, separately JTC is also very keen to look at. Uh, and I think there are also a lot of studies that's going on uh, in looking at going to the sea. Connectivity is important. Uh, but then if you look at the way we used to commute between Singapore and Bukong, it's not such a huge problem. Ferries take people across. If you look at Hong Kong, the Star Ferry carries people across. So ferries has been around for a long time. Uh, today with hovercrafts and other new innovations, transporting people is not such a huge problem. Right. Uh, as far as uh, treatment, you know, the m and &E services are concerned, like you know, how do you treat waste? All these are solutions are all available. If you look at uh, cruise ships, 10,000 people on board, they deal with the you know, the, the waste treatment, the food problem, the desalination of the water straight from the sea, they descend. So those problems are not really problems because the solutions are there. And, and really, we, we should look at uh, this area seriously. We are very short on seafront land. I mean, if you look at the entire coast of Singapore, practically every meter of our coast is occupied. So I think there's huge potential and we should look seriously in that direction. What I have problem with, I'm one of the uh, people who are championing uh, sea solutions, as uh, floating solutions. <clears throat> one of the problems I have is talking to people who says, yeah, good idea, great, but how do we go about it, you know? Because there is no master plan of the sea in Singapore. We got a master plan on land, right? People know exactly that if you want to put a factory, you go to Jurong. But in the sea, if I want to put a factory, where shall I put it, right? So we need a master plan for our sea. And I hope that can be developed soon. 
And we need some kind of direction because there are ideas popping out every day around the world on floating solutions. But in Singapore, we don't have a, a roadmap to go to, you know, to address these problems. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. I don't know whether any URA chaps here to <laughs> respond to that. Well, I, not, do, I can convey your request to uh, URA. I do have an idea for the next uh, CLC talk. It's basically the marine innovations. And I do understand JTC is also doing air rights uh, development. So that also needs a master plan in 3D. So that could be interesting as well. Yeah, but uh, Mr. Lim, I think um, that, that comment is, is really well taken. Uh, it is something that leaves quite a lot, I think, to the imagination and it's something that uh, certainly merits uh, a lot more study. Um, I would just uh, be interested about having your point of view about the sustainability part of uh, the sustainability uh, discussion. So the, you mentioned the um, uh, eight, and cooling, uh, eight uh, district and cooling systems, which is very interesting at the uh, district level uh, to optimize the efficiency and the sustainability of district. What are other solutions you are thinking of uh, to optimize the global footprint of those uh, innovation parks? Uh, well, I mean, there are lots of, uh, DCS is one, okay? Um, they are also discussing, we are also looking at uh, a pneumatic waste conveyancing system. Uh, that could be another. Um, we are also looking at, uh, I mean, ex example could be uh, wayfinding, car parking systems, uh, so that you know where to park. You don't go round and round the whole district and finding where to park. Um, in fact, some of our buildings, for example, uh, uh, the basements are all integrated, connected, so that if you, if you park in one building and you find that not enough car park, you can actually go to the next building. Uh, so that's how we design the Biopolis. Uh, we have seven buildings in Biopolis. The seven buildings in Biopolis are actually all interconnected at the basement level. So in a sense that there are many, many district level type uh, facilities that we, can, that we can think about. Um, but at the end of the day, we hope that we can enhance the competitiveness of the companies. That's the key, right? To help companies to be able to do their jobs better, to be able to reduce their business costs. Um, actually, referring to your presentation, uh, two brief questions. First one, you just mentioned but didn't uh, expand your thoughts on the servicization. So my question is on the future of the service industry in Singapore. And the uh, second part of the question is actually about if Singapore sustains the current pace of um, current share, let's say, of 20% of manufacture, um, manufacturing, what would be the future of this and how to balance out with the high tech, with the new technologies, uh, with the disruption that you mentioned, and keeping the, industry, uh, keeping the manufacturing uh, at the current pace? Thank you. Well, I think, I think services supports the manufacturing, okay? So that's equally important. Now, I didn't mention a lot, but logistics is one. That, uh, that we will definitely need logistics, uh, warehousing, logistics, urban logistics, to be able to support the manufacturing activity. But I think what's more important is that there are some manufacturers who are moving down into manufacturing services. Okay? And I sh shared with you the example about Rolls-Royce, where they sell engine as a solution, rather than sell engine as it is. So I think uh, between manufacturing and services, they are equally important. Um, take the chemical industry, for example. Uh, the chemical industry is where it is today because we have a very strong trading services support. Right? Singapore is one of the largest uh, uh, trading, the third largest trading hub, uh, not only in physical trading but also derivative trading. So in terms, you need to have both physical and non-physical. So I think manufacturing and services will, hand, will come together quite well. Right? Um, the second question, I think, is on the manufacturing, right? The percentage. Manufacturing and the high tech. Okay, how would that, how, how would new, uh, well, I think our target, target, uh, as I talk about target, is really to maintain manufacturing at about 20 to 25% of our GDP. That's our target. Now, obviously, it will move up and down, right? In 2015, it's 20%. Uh, I'm not sure what's the 2016 numbers. Uh, but essentially, you will have, uh, when you go into advanced manufacturing, uh, you go into uh, automation and robotics, technically speaking, that should drive up your productivity. Okay? So hopefully when it drives up your productivity, your manufacturing share 
will also hopefully, huh? hopefully, I'm not saying that it will, hopefully will go up. I'm curious because you did say live in your urban innovation title, yeah? But it looks like in your JID, it's pretty much like One North, hardly any residential component. So I don't know whether uh, it's not your purview or it's done in conjunction with URA. If so, how are you going to do it? One question. Huh? Second thing is, um, uh, you're still going to look at 20%, right? Any particular industries are you eyeing? Okay, and the third thing is, uh, is the ATC still looking at underground production spaces? Thank you. Oh, your fourth question. How is your JIT connected to the new TWAS, the new port TWAS? Not, uh, not connected at all. But how are you going to, I mean, eventually the two got to be connected like at the dumbbell, right? For them to work together. Uh -huh. Firstly, um, when I say the residential, uh, it is also a percentage of the space for residential, okay? Uh, there will be some residential development within JID. But I think equally important is how JID is then interconnected and leveraged on the vast Jurong West that is surrounding JID, okay? So that is equally important. So it's not only looking at residential inside JID, but residential with the surrounding. Okay. So that's for JID. And similarly for Tengah, you probably have heard there's a Tengah new town coming up. Uh, part of JID is within Tengah. So again, how does the Tengah part of JID uh, integrate with the Tengah new town? I think that's important. Right? Uh, so that's on the residential part. But potential industry, I did highlight a few. Right? Advanced manufacturing is one that we are looking at. Cybersecurity is the other. Uh, Internet of Things is the other. Okay? So these are some of the new industries uh, that potentially will come. Uh, well, that's a trend now, right? And the various economic agency is trying to see how we can bring some of this industry. But essentially is how different industry make use of technology. I think that's also equally important, right? how existing industry transform itself and make use of technology. So in the past, you may be doing this, but how can I do it better with automation and robotics? Upskilling the people to be able to uh, be more efficient and more productive. I think that's equally important. Underground, <clears throat> we've recently completed the uh, Jurong Rock Caverns. I think you know that we are looking at various underground developments, but they are all at the conceptual stage, right? Some of them at the R&D stage. Uh, the key thing about going underground is how do we go down in such a way that it is uh, the cost, we can bring down the cost of going underground. Because anything that goes underground is, is expensive. So how do we reduce the cost of developing underground uh, projects? That would be the key. Right? It's not that we don't want to go underground, but the question is, how do we do so in a cost-effective manner? Right? So that people don't mind going underground. In fact, if you look at Singapore, there are a lot of underground development, right? Uh, go to all the MRT stations, they're all underground. Right? There are lots of underground roads everywhere. Uh, even shopping malls, right? city mall, they're all underground. Uh, and underground is not new. You go to other countries, they're, they're everywhere. Right? Japan... And lots of underground facilities. Uh, TWAS, well, it's nothing to do with TWAS, Jurong Innovation District. Today, many of the industries that we have are going through changes, and many of the industries that we want to promote um, need to experiment with a lot of things. And um, So it is now more difficult to pick winners or to even predict the longevity of the industries. Now, in that respect, and then you mentioned a couple of times about creating flexible working spaces. Can you elaborate on how do we create such flexible working spaces uh, such that it allow room for experimentation and at the same time also reduce the risk such that the cost of failure is somehow some of these experiments don't work out, right? can be managed both for the companies as well as for JTC? Well, our, our, our buildings are designed in such a way that not only are they functional, but 
they allow flexible use of the space. So a lot of our buildings, if you just take a floor plate, if you want a whole floor, you can have the whole floor. You want half the floor, you can have half the floor. You want to have one small little, one quarter, and then with a view to expand in, say, six months down the road, we will help you to facilitate that. So in a sense, it's flexible space providing. Okay, that's the key. Because we know that in different industries, when they start, they may start at this level. After a while, they expand. They can come up to this level. Economy turns, they may come down, and so on and so forth. So I think the, what JTC provides is the ability for you to scale up and down. Uh, and that's the key in terms of flexible space provision. Okay. That will help, hopefully help companies to be able to reduce their business risk. Um. So my question actually speaks to, I'm interested in what Peter or your gentleman from Arab um, was asking and I just wanted to get you to build on your, your response a little bit. Um, so you talked about how you decide to place a cluster or a certain industry after that's been decided, like food, for example. So where should the food district be placed? What's the process of deciding how it's food in the first place? What if it's fashion or something else? Right, I mean, certain organizations uh, like mine, we use some foresight methods like scenario planning, with complexity mapping. There's a lot of different methods. What's the decision-making process as you understand it? Oh, it's a very complex decision-making. But essentially is that if you look at the, um, what EDB does and what Spring does, is they will determine what are the different industries that, is, uh, that Singapore needs. Okay. Uh, and once they have decided that industry, they will go in depth into, into that industry. Uh, okay, first of all, you have to decide what industry first, right? And that will depend on what is the trend and what are the needs of the, the world, right? No point, I don't know what industry that sunset already, but essentially is this is the industry that you want, then you, 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 you want to promote them into Singapore or you want to grow them in Singapore, okay? Uh, next is, of course, to determine where to locate them. And then next, of course, is to determine what kind of infrastructure or building that they need. And here we work very closely with the trade associations, uh, various associations, because they represent the companies and we collaborate with them to understand their needs. And then once we understand their needs, we will then develop the, the building or the infrastructure to support them. So it is a very iterative process uh, and we need to work very closely with the industries. Collaboration with the industry to us is key. We don't build anything without knowing what the industry wants. And we work very closely with them to determine what they need. Maybe if I could probe just a little bit further. Um, JTC clearly is influenced by these uh, decisions and both an influencer of these decisions at the same time. Wherein lies the push and pull uh, in terms of how you master plan as opposed to say the other planning authority, URA, uh, versus say HDB as well. And certainly there would be loops where you could actually feed back to EDB and Spring uh, imaginably. So what sort of models, if you can share them of course, uh, uh, come about in determining food would be the next big thing for instance? Well the only comment I'd say is everybody needs to eat. So <laughs> food industry is obviously an industry that we need, right? And, and, and we move from there. Yeah. And, and, and EDB will be out there to decide and determine what's the trend and so on. All right. So three questions again. First is, does JTC need architects? Second is, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Second question is, um, underground or in the sea, what, um, how do you R&D you know, before you actually set foot? Underground? Set? your tunnels underground. Third question would then be, um, where's the line between JTC and URA? <laughs> well, URA is Urban Redevelopment Authority, if I get you right, right? They are, they are essentially the, uh, the planner for Singapore's, uh, I mean the development of Singapore, so they plan the whole Singapore, okay? Uh, essentially, JTC, we are a uh, industrial, uh, development agency, okay, we are a government agency looking after industrial development. So we will plan the industrial area that URA has designated as industrial area. Okay, so that's how we do. So URA will be the Singapore planner or master planner. We will be industrial master planner and planner. 
So whatever URA says, this area it must be for industry, then we will take that area and, and, and master plan that area. So that's how we work very closely with URA. Of course, URA does a lot more things, and we also do a lot more other things, uh, but essentially that's what it means when it comes to planning. Right. Um, creating uh, space. We do have architects and we do recruit architects. So any architects out here, if you are keen to join JDC, uh, you can send your CV over to myself or Rachel, who is sitting over there. <laughs> uh, we are happy to, uh, uh, to recruit architects too. The way we do it is that we know our industry less because we've been interacting with them for, well, 40, 49 years. Okay? Uh, and we know what they want over the years. Of course, there are new, new things that they want as, as things come along. Uh, so we have a lot of in-house architects that does a lot of this, what we call conceptual design. So most of our buildings like that you see, uh, the conceptual design are all done by us. The function of it, how things move, uh, how much factory space you need, um, where should the, uh, the lift, the cargo lifts be, uh, how should you bring the trucks in and out, uh, where to put your wet, uh, coal, coal room, where to put your waste treatment plants, and so on and so forth. So we come up with a conceptual design in consultation, of course, and in collaboration with the industries and the associations. That's one thing, that's the first thing to do. Then the detailed design usually will be done by the external architects, right? Although we do some detailed design ourselves, but the majority of the detailed design uh, and the engineering will be done by external consultants. So we work very closely with uh, the various consultants, I think most, some of you are in this room today. Thank you very much for being our partner. Okay, so we work very closely with you. That's the second question. <laughs> the third question is on R&D. Uh, we do have a small R&D outfit, not very big. Uh, we call it the Innovation Program Office. Uh, and within the, our engineering arm and within our architectural and project management arm, we do have people looking at different types of innovation in R&D. But we leverage a lot on our universities. Okay. Today we have three research centers, uh, one with NTU, one with NUS, and the other one with SUTD. So we work very closely with the universities uh, who are like a contract R&D for us. Okay. Uh, because we tap on the wide expertise of the professors uh, out there as well as all the students out there. So we do a lot of research with them, be it uh, blue sky research, uh, as well as uh, applied research, and even test bedding, uh, and, uh, okay, and even prototyping. Uh, recently, I think you all may have heard, we developed two robots. One is called a Pictobot, the other one is called a Quickabot, right? One paints, and the other one does conquest scores, right? Basically, uh, determine whether the wall is straight, the floor is level, and whether there's any cracks in the wall, because the naked eye can't see, right? So we, we install infrared onto, our, onto the robot and be able to scan for any cracks or any, uh, because if the wall has hollowness, the color changes. So we can determine whether there's any crack, right? So we work very closely with our universities. That's one. The second is we, we also have our innovation calls, right? We have the first one and the second one. We are probably going to launch another one this year. So look out for it in, the, uh, in our website. But essentially is that we work closely with companies who may have an idea. And we partner them. They will do the research and we will test bait their research in our facilities. Okay. It could be at the building level or it could be at the district level. So an example of uh, one of the innovations, Ecosoft is one of our partners, if I'm not wrong. Right? Okay. They are looking in uh, wastewater treatment, if I'm not wrong. Black water, black water uh, recycling. Right. So they have their own technology, but they need a space to test and see whether it works or not. So we provide them the space physically connected 
in our buildings. Okay? Uh, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, it's still one part of the building, not the whole part of the building, of course. <laughs> right? So we provide, you use our building as a platform, as a living lab for companies to be able to do that. So that's how we do our R&D. Right, so uh, I guess we've come to pretty much the end of the afternoon. I've got one closing question uh, for you, David, and that would be, seeing that you know, we've both been invited by the Center for Livable Cities, how then would JTC design Singapore to be more livable? Would there be a livability quotient? Would there be a certain uh, consideration for livability that you would take up? Well, absolutely. If you look at my earlier presentation, we, we want to develop our district and our buildings uh, as not only sustainable, but also livable. Essentially, when we say sustainable and livable, is we want to create the right conducive environment for not only the industry to be able to operate, but also for the people who want to work there. So making sure that you know, all our industrial estates are livable, not so much as to live there, but working there in an excellent conducive environment. Thank you.